Hey there, 8th graders. This is Mr. O'Day here to talk to you a little bit about Chapter 12. That's our first chapter in astronomy. Before we get into astronomy, though, I want to lead off with a little bit of science vocabulary. Uh, in particular, some vocabulary that comes from uh, Latin word origins. And so, no, look at the list here. You'll see a few uh, that look probably pretty familiar to you. Um, you may not know the Latin word itself, but you might know uh, or recognize uh, the word that it um, uh, that comes from that word. So, equalis, we see that one. Obviously, the word equal is right in the middle there. Uh, and that'll be coming back when we get into equinox uh, and when we talk about um, seasons and so on. Uh, crater is just uh, the same as the crater that we're used to. Uh, it comes from the word that means uh, mixing bowl. Uh, and if you think of a crater on a moon, it has that sort of bowl shape. Uh, gravitas, we see the word gravity in there, so anytime we talk about gravity, we're talking about weight or heaviness. Uh, so gravity is the force that pulls things down. Uh, luna uh, is the word for moon, and so anytime we talk about something lunar, uh, lunar eclipses in this chapter, lunar highlands, uh, you know that that's relating to the moon. Uh, mare uh, means sea, and so you've got um, Maria and Mare, uh, if you think of the word marine, marine biology, marine ecosystems, right? We're talking about the sea, anything in the sea or the ocean. Uh, Solaris, um, you recognize the word solar in there, so that is related to the sun. And then, of course, umbra, which if you think about it, looks a little bit like umbrella. And so that means shade or shadow. And so penumbra and uh, umbra are types of shadows. Uh, and so we'll be learning a little bit more about those. But it, it's good to know those. I just like to lead off with that uh, just to get you in the right mindset. Uh, we'll talk about Greek word origins later. So section one of chapter 12 is all about Earth in space. So the big questions we're going to be discussing are how does Earth move in space? Uh, and then what causes the cycle of seasons on Earth? So let's get into it. Starting off with how Earth moves. We know that Earth moves in space in two major ways, rotation and revolution. Uh, revolution is the movement of one object around another. So we see in the picture there that the Earth is moving all the way around the sun. Uh, we, you should know that the moon also does the same going around the Earth, uh, as do um, all moons around planets and all the planets around stars, right? They are revolving. Right? They're going through one revolution, one object around the other. So think a little bit. How long does it take for one complete revolution of Earth around the sun? What do you think? How long does it take us to make the complete journey to go all the way around the sun? Uh, you may have said 24 hours one day, but you were mistaken. The answer is 365.25 days. If you said a year, I'll give it to you. Most people don't know that a year actually is 365 and 0.25. A lot of people miss that. You have one quarter days added there. And you may wonder what happens to that quarter day, and we will get into that uh, in just a few slides. How about the, uh, the orbit here? Uh, the orbit just means the path uh, that the Earth takes around the sun, or the path that a moon might take around a planet. Uh, is our orbit circular? What do you think? It often looks circular in books um, and on the internet, but in actuality it is an ellipse, an elongated circle. It's very, very close to being a circle, uh, but it's slightly elongated, and this has an effect as to how you know far away we are from the sun. Uh, sometimes we're closer, sometimes we're farther away uh, at different points of the year. We'll get to that later. So, the other way that the Earth moves is uh, called rotation. It's the spinning of the Earth on its axis. Um, that word axis looks a little bit like axle, like the axle on a car or a bike, which is sort of the, um, the piece of metal or the tube or pipe that the uh, wheel is spinning on. And we have an imaginary axle in the Earth, um, and that's called our axis. And so we spin uh, eastward, so we're always spinning towards the east. If you're looking east, you're looking at the direction that we're spinning. Uh, and um, one thing to remember is that only half of the planet is facing the sun, uh, while the other half is not. So 
no matter what time of day it is, half of the earth is always going to be lit up by the sun, right? Uh, it just depends uh, whether or not you experience day or night, just depends on, you know, where you are on the planet and if you're facing the sun or not. Uh, but uh, remember that half of the earth is always lit up and the other half is dark. So there, there's your day and night. So day and night is caused by rotation. Um, and how long does it take for us to rotate once? So think of day and night. How long does that take? It's 24 hours, right? That's one day. So one spin on its axis, that is one day, one rotation. So then thinking about ancient civilizations and, and why was it important for them to sort of keep track of these, you know, revolutions and the years and the months and the days, uh, we have to talk a little bit about calendars, right? And calendars are just a way of organizing time. It defines the beginning, the length, uh, and the divisions of a year. And uh, you'll notice if you look at these three calendars here, these are three ancient calendars, the Mayan calendar, Egyptian calendar, and Stonehenge. Um, they are not exactly like the calendars we have today, but um, they do sort of uh, different positions on there, different points on those uh, correspond to different times of the year, whether it's the solstices or equinoxes or other events. Uh, and why might it be important uh, for these people to be keeping track of this stuff? Well, uh, it's important because they needed to know, you know, when uh, these big events during the year are going to happen. And when, when I say big events, I'm talking about things like floods, monsoons, uh, you know, dry spells. Um, and this is important for them when it comes to planting crops. Um, so they need to know when they should be growing their food. Uh, they need to know when a variety of things are happening, all these cyclical events, right? And the word cycle, right, is, you know, talking about how it's repeating. And the, the fact that these are all circular, uh, kind of indicate that they're, they knew about this cycle, that it happened year after year, um, on and on forever, pretty much. And so um, going back to uh, our calendar here, occasionally we have what's called a uh, leap year. So do you guys know what a leap year is? Basically, it's a year that has an extra day added, February 29th, and it happens every four years. So you might think, well, why is that? Well, remember back when we saw that uh, the one year equaled 365.25 days. Well, we don't celebrate a quarter of a day every year and then move on to the next day. Uh, what we do is we forget about that quarter of a day for three years. And then on the fourth year, we take all those quarters, four quarters, and we put them together to make one full complete day. And that kind of catches us up on the calendar system. Uh, and so that's why we have a leap year, so every four years. And the next leap year is 2016. Uh, we had one a couple of years ago. Maybe you know someone with a February 29th birthday. That's special. So then, okay, now we need to talk about, uh, and when we talk about seasons, you think, okay, this season it's hot and this season it's cold. Um, why does it get hot or cold during these different seasons, during different times of the year? Um, a lot of people think that it's the distance uh, that the sun is from the earth. Uh, it's not so much that, it is the energy that we get from the sun. Uh, is it striking us more directly or you know, more indirectly? Uh, and so if you look at this picture here, we see that at the equator, the people that live at the equator, they are getting the most direct sunlight. They are getting that sunlight at a 90 degree angle, perpendicular, to the surface of the earth so, so it's the most intense sun at the equator and when you look at a map uh, and you look at where the equator is that's where all the rainforests are pretty much you've got the uh, African rainforest here the Congo and so on you've got Malaysia over here uh, and uh, you know Indonesia Southeast Asia and then on the other side of the earth you've got the Amazon all of these are right around the equator and the, the weather that we have there is hot, humid, pretty much all year round. They don't have seasons like we know it. They just have kind of a wet and a dry season, uh, but it's always pretty hot. Then as you get further from the equator, that same amount of sunlight uh, starts to get stretched out a little bit more. As the Earth's curvature uh, starts to move away from the equator and, and go towards the poles, this sunlight is more stretched out. And so you're getting less direct sunlight 
the same amount of energy is being applied to a larger area and therefore it's just not as hot there. And if you take that to the extreme and go all the way up to the poles, the North Pole or down to the South Pole, they're getting very little direct sunlight and that's why it's cold there year round. They have permanent ice there year after year. Um, we'll see what global warming does about that, but that's pretty much how it's been for a long, long time. Uh, and it's because they get very little direct sunlight. So the next slide has a little video that's gonna show you uh, more detail about how this works uh, using an analogy with a flashlight. Here's an experiment that can show why the angle of the sun's rays are so important in the amount of energy that reaches a certain area on the Earth. We'll use a flashlight and some graph paper. Pretend that the flashlight is the sun and the graph paper is the Earth's surface. Okay. When the sun is overhead and shining straight down, it covers a certain area of the graph paper. Kind of like at the equator. Now, to represent the sun shining on the earth at an angle, we will hold the flashlight at a slant. Notice that the light spreads out over a larger area. When the light spreads out, it is less intense, and the energy also spreads out. More direct light would mean more concentrated energy. The temperatures and climate around the equator don't vary as much as other places on the globe because the rays strike at more of a straight angle. All right, so hopefully that video cleared a few things up for you about the tilt of the Earth and how the direct sunlight affects the temperature on different parts of the planet. And at that point, we'll stop for now, and I'd like you to go back to my website and click on the Socrative link for the quiz. Uh, take the quiz, and then we'll talk more about seasons tomorrow. Thank you.